With the passing of Ash Wednesday a few days ago, we entered into this season of Lent. Lent, it's 40 days long, but we don't count Sundays because every Sunday is considered a feast day, a day to remember the Easter resurrection, a day to celebrate. And so Lent entered into the church's calendar as this opportunity for fasting, for reflection, for giving up something to remember what our Lord gave up for us as he journeyed to the cross of Good Friday. And in the Northern Hemisphere, when the church in her history and tradition added this season of Lent to the church's calendar, it was intended to be a type of uh, spring cleaning for the soul, an opportunity to look at how we've contributed to the sin that placed Jesus on the cross. As a matter of fact, the word Lent comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word for spring. Spring. What a wonderful word that is, isn't it? Especially as we begin this season on uh, one of the coldest time periods that we've had here in a long time. And the, the snow almost this morning, even though it affects church attendance, was appropriate because it has us longing for the coming of spring. We can't wait for those days to go by fast enough to get us to that season of sun and fun and getting out again and cleaning up our yards and cleaning up our houses and everything else. Well, see, that's our theme as we begin this time of Lent. It's an opportunity for us to reflect upon the movement of time. As we go through our schedules and our routines and our calendars and everything else that crowds our lives, we know sometimes the moments seem to drag. Other times, time flies. And if you were listening carefully to Mark's recording of the Gospel lesson, you hear him use language that is very much fixed in time and the movement of time. He begins with, in those days. After the baptism of Jesus, the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days. <clears throat> Finally, the time is fulfilled. Time. It is intentional that this season of Lent begin our reflection upon the journey of the cross by reflecting also on the movement of time. For in a certain sense, time is the result of sin. The need for us to count time, remember time, reflect upon time is all because things have a beginning and unfortunately they have an ending. And scripture teaches us that it's the wages of sin that brings death. So the fact that time becomes important, that we fill our calendars with all these things, crowding our lives out in order to do everything we need to do, is because we know someday we won't have the time. Death will come. And so as the season of Lent calls us to take a look at sin, we can't but help to focus a little bit on time. For if there was no death, we would have all the time in the world. You procrastinators would be just fine because you always would have tomorrow to get done what you couldn't get done today. But that's not the reality of our lives. All too often, we can't do the things we want to do. Too often, our time in this life is filled with pain and suffering and struggle. And there are those days where all of a sudden, we've run out of time. The reality of death strikes too quickly and too harshly. And for as much as we rejoice and celebrate every new beginning, every new birth, there's always a twinge of sadness. Because we know that as there is that beginning, someday there will be that end. And that's why as we begin this journey of Lent and we begin the journey to the cross, we are reminded once again of how our God reaches out into time in this world to be with us, to set us apart. That's our comfort on this journey of Lent, is the reminder to us that our God and our Creator just didn't set the spark in motion and let creation be on its own. But the God of all creation came into history, came into time in this world in order to give us the ability to deal with the things that so often trouble our time in this life. 
Christ our Savior had a beginning through the womb of Mary coming into the world. And he had an ending too, which is our reflection as we journey to the cross. But he did this and he lived his time in this world so that by the Easter resurrection, we see how his mission and purpose in coming into time in this world was to transcend and overcome time. So it doesn't have to be something that troubles us so greatly. And we see during his earthly life and ministry, him working in the real world with real people in real history, giving them what they need for healing, for hope, for forgiveness, and for grace. And that's why, as Mark records for us that Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he begins with his baptism, and immediately time becomes an issue. Those 40 days in the wilderness being tempted, a reminder to us that he would be the, the power over sin to resist sin so he can be that spotless lamb of sacrifice for us so that we can have that promise and that hope of the resurrection. And that's why, as he came out of the wilderness, as he moved forward into this earthly ministry, he made that announcement, the time is fulfilled. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Why? Because of what he goes on to say in the rest of the sentence. The kingdom of God has come near. You are not alone. As you journey through your life and your time in this world, the kingdom of God is near you. Heaven is by your side. The God of all creation who's made you with a value and a place and a purpose and a plan will never leave you and forsake you. That's the announcement that's being made by the life, the ministry, the miracles, and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's why he says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God has come near, repent, and most importantly, believe in the good news. Good news. Literally the gospel. Too often our lives in this world don't have enough good news. Too often the problems that we have with our days and our time in this world is because of the bad news that surround us and the pain that surrounds us. And yet Jesus comes into this world making the kingdom of heaven near to us so we have that good news. No, we have that great news that even though sadly sin brings death and time is always moving forward, sometimes a lot faster than any of us are comfortable with, there is the great news of the day of the resurrection when time matters no more. Where that concept of eternity becomes very real for us. And to give us that assurance that God is near us always, we have the gift of baptism. That's why Jesus' earthly ministry began with his baptism, to make that connection to us, that concrete moment, sign, and assurance to us that we are not alone, that as our time in this world is sometimes filled with struggle and doubt when it comes to the things of faith, we need only remember that moment of our baptisms, that as we are connected to Christ Jesus, that just as he was raised from the dead, we too walk in that newness of life, as Paul reminds us. Baptism is that covenant promise that we are never alone. It's that objective moment in our lives where we can always be certain God is near. And we see this thread of baptism taking us through the entire Lenten journey. And that's why on this first Sunday of Lent, in all of our readings, baptism is a theme. Even in the reading of the Old Testament when we hear about the, the flood of Noah. When the flood was over, everything was said and done with, we hear God using the word covenant with Noah over and over again. And the rainbow becomes the sign of the covenant, the promise that this would never happen again, the promise of God's grace and goodness. And Peter goes on then, so many years later, to make that connection of the waters of Noah and the covenant promise of Noah to the waters of baptism. That as the waters saved the chosen at the time of Noah, it's the waters of baptism that save and bring new life today. And all that then culminates pointing to Jesus' baptism. How he changes the whole world through his life and ministry from that moment forward. That's the good news. The great news that we need to hear in our time in this world. 
rainbows since the day of Noah have been constantly a spiritual symbol and theme reminding people of promise and hope for things yet to come. Started with the people of Israel, the Jews in the Old Testament, it transcended into the Christians, and then throughout many other cultures and people throughout time in history in this world, rainbows have had significance. In the Middle Ages, the Germans often see, saw rainbows as a promise that the world wasn't going to end for another 40 years. So every time they saw a rainbow, they exhaled some relief, because they knew they had a lot more time ahead of them. We know about the Irish as we approach St. Patty's Day, right? At the end of the rainbow are the leprechauns and the treasures and the gold and everything else. The Japanese often saw rainbows as a floating bridge to heaven. And that was built upon an ancient theme from the Native American Indians, where they also saw the rainbow as a connection to eternity. Sometimes our movement through life in this world and the, the movement of time and our calendars and our schedules can be psychologically overwhelming. We can't believe how much time flies by in our life, how much more we want to do, but how much has already gone by. And yet this journey through the time of Lent is a reminder to us that our God came into time and history in this world so we don't have to worry about time. He transcended time by being the victory over death, what waits for us at the end of the Lenten journey with the Easter resurrection to show us that we have all the time in this world because of what's yet to come. And so as we continue to move forward as God's people, it is this wonderful promise that awaits us. We focus on sin, yeah, it's not fun to do, we don't really like to admit we're wrong and we've made mistakes, but the joy in this journey is that promise that at the end of the rainbow, at the end of our journey, is the Easter resurrection, where time matters no more. That's what it means to have eternal life. Amen.